Good evening. I'm Dr. Fred Rouse, the Real Money Doctor, and it's currently Thursday. Um, where are we at here? The 20th of August, and it's 7 o'clock, and I want to do today's daily recap of events that affect the way you get, protect, and enjoy your money, your life, and your retirement. Now, the question for today is, can you make a difference? And again, one more strange question, but we'll get into it a little bit later on. But for now, I want to touch base on the current number of COVID cases. Again, that's the biggest thing. Uh, that's moving everything at this point in time. It's a uh, big mover worldwide. It's a big mover here in the U.S. It's affected the economy. It's going to be a big part of the upcoming elections. So right now, uh, current cases are 5,562,000 cases. That's another 46,000 since yesterday. Now the number of deaths, 173,882 people have died total since this thing got started. That's another 1,200 people since yesterday. So you're having consistent days now, a string of consistent days where over 1,000 people a day in the U.S. are dying from COVID. Now, it's been almost two weeks, maybe three weeks. California has been the highest number of cases. And right now, they have 650,000 cases. They're up a little over 9,000 cases since yesterday. There are deaths right now in California or 11,727. So again, that's the total number since this got started back in January, February, March, depending on when you want to look at things. Okay, first case was actually reported uh, in January, but nobody got serious about it until basically mid-March. So right now, California had almost 200 people, not quite 200 people die since yesterday from COVID. Florida's got the number two spot. Texas remains at number three. New York is at number four. Again, they they were big originally. New York and New Jersey were big states originally when this thing got started. Uh, New York and New Jersey have both been pretty much under control. But because of those initial numbers back in March and April, okay, they still rank up there at number four. Georgia's at number five. Illinois is at number six. Arizona's at seven right now. Okay, New Jersey is number eight. And North Carolina is number nine. Okay, Louisiana is at number 10. And again, it's the southern states that are getting hit right now, the southern and the western states. And it's not a second surge. It's just their initial peak that didn't happen initially. It peaked initially in February, March, April in um, on the East Coast with New York and New Jersey. And then it's they projected these peaks later on but nobody paid attention to them. Uh, right now, school reopenings remain a really big thing in this COVID pandemic. And there has been just tons and tons of misleading, non-fact-based comments about kids and the chance of getting sick and spreading COVID. Well, the evidence right now is growing that children may play a much larger role in transmission than what was previously believed. Again, as more information comes through, things change and you learn more and you adjust as you go on. And that's the way life should be anyway. And it happens that way when you're a baby, okay? You're crawling and all of a sudden you decide, well, everybody else is walking around, let me try that. And you keep falling down and you fall down, you fall down, you make adjustments and you fall down. And, and as you get more experience, you get better with balance. And all of a sudden you can start to walk. Same thing is happening here with COVID situation. Nobody knew what was going on initially and as we gain more information from the cases, more numbers from the cases, more patients, how they're dealing with things initially and over a longer term, we learn more, we make more adjustments as we go. Right now, the latest study is a small study, but it shows that the kids' rates of infection for viral loads, means the amount of virus that they actually have on with them, okay, makes them really silent spreaders. As schools reopen in parts of the United States right now, a study was just published, okay, uh, Thursday, in fact, that some children have really, really high virus levels in their airways during the first three days of their infection, despite having really mild symptoms or none at all. Now, that really suggests their role in community spread may be much, much larger than was previously believed. Now, one of the study's authors, uh, Dr. Fasano, Okay. He's a physician at Mass General Hospital for Children, said that because children tend to exhibit few, if any, symptoms, they were basically largely ignored in the early part of the outbreak and not tested. But 
now they may have been acting as silent spreaders all along. Dr. Fasano said some people thought that children might be protected. And that was going around for a while. And I'm certain you remember that. A lot of people were spreading that. But it's totally incorrect. Okay. They may be as susceptible as adults, but it's just not visible. Now, in the study of uh, Journal of Pediatrics, comes on the heel of two other studies that offer insights into about how children and coronavirus transmission are occurring. Now, on uh, July 30th, researchers reported in JAMA that uh, children younger than five with mild or moderate illness may have much higher levels of virus in the nose compared with older children and adults. Shortly before that, investigators in South Korea published a household study that some believed implied older children could spread the virus okay, just as readily as adults, while younger children less so. But again, as things went on, we find out more information. And we found that researchers later clarified that it was really unclear whether that transmission came from older children or from the contacts that they shared with other family members. And that's a whole different situation. Um, with kids in multi-generational families, when you have those situations, you're getting a much higher transmission along everyone in the household. And uh, maybe I'll talk about that tomorrow. It was interesting when I found that out today. Anyway, all three of these studies were small and some you know, contradicted one another in some, some of the details. So the researchers said they, they really couldn't draw any definitive conclusions based on any one of them alone, but taken together, they all paint a really worrisome picture of children's role in the pandemic. And the newest study reported that the viral loads of children were significantly higher than those of severely ill adults in a hospital. You would never really expect that, but that's what they found. The viral loads in the kids was much, much higher than the actual adults in the hospitals. However, children and adults were not in the same stages of the illness. The children's level were measured days uh, zero to two of the infection compared to seven days or longer for adults. I don't know that, what that means just yet. They haven't quite figured it out either. Now, the study's lead author, uh, pediatric specialist at Mass General said that okay, the larger side-by-side -side analysis is really needed to compare the viral loads over time in adults versus kids. And that makes perfect sense. But the point is, when you consider the ICU, there are many, many precautions in place to protect healthcare workers from contracting the virus. But kids who are mildly symptomatic early in the infections are walking around in the community and we really need to minimize the potential of these children okay, spreading the virus. Now, since the virus first appeared in December, um, back December 31st actually, its impact on children has been really the most baffling. Time has confirmed that most children appear to have mild disease or no symptoms at all, okay? But that really remains a mystery. Okay. They don't show signs of the virus symptoms that, that adults normally have, but they're projecting a different set of a syndrome of, of things that seem to affect what they do. And we don't know what it affects on them long-term from this, again, as we move on, as time moves on, we have more patients to study, we have more follow-up time, and we see what happens over time, and we can narrow down okay, what we can expect in the future. Right now, the new study provides one of the most detailed looks at the immune, immune reaction in children exposed to coronavirus. Of the 192 pediatric patients seen at Boston, uh, Boston's uh, Mass General Hospital, and Mass General Hospital for Children, 49 were diagnosed with acute infection, an additional 18 with MIS-C, an inflammatory, uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome, okay, that's linked to the virus. And that's the thing that's, it throws people off. It's a, it affects a number of different organs, okay? And they're not exactly certain what goes on with it just yet. They're getting closer but they're getting close to a vaccine too. And that's not happening just yet either. But again, as more people study these things, we learn more information. Right now, the, the mean age of the children in the study was 10 years old. The percentage of children who tested positive for the virus was about 20%. Now, Dr. Fasano compared that 
with about 20% for adults. Mm -hmm. Among the other preliminary findings, uh, age did not really seem to affect the viral load or you know, the amount of virus present. And the viral load appeared especially high about two days into the infections. A separate study out this month from Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. of 177 uh, children and young adults with SARS-CoV-2 okay, infections between March 15 and April 30 found that the youngest and oldest were more likely to be hospitalized and the oldest were more likely to require critical care. Why this is, we don't know just yet. The central question is though, why is it that so many more children have mild illnesses compared to adults? That would be some really serious, valuable information. If we could learn and harness that information, could really be used to treat everyone. Now, right now, the most important lesson that pediatric specialists have learned over the last eight months is that this disease okay, never stops surprising us. There's always something new. Those that are concerned with, you know, so we don't really know what's happening with that. They, they try. And again, as more information comes available, okay, they're trying to put this together. But we'll see what happens with that. Now, for the market situation, there's a lot of people that are still concerned with what's going on in the markets, and, and that's okay. Okay, the Dow was up 46 points today and closed at 27.7, basically. The S&P gained, uh, S&P 500 gained about 0.3% and uh, ended the day at 3,300. And the NASDAQ composite advanced basically 1.1% and closed at 1,100 and 2,000, uh, 11,200. Uh, there's really much easier ways to make money without continued worry about the daily volatility and the market crashes. But people keep doing these things out of habit, you know, or basically out of lack of knowing anything better. Okay, uh, it's Thursday and the job numbers are out. The number of people applying for first time unemployment insurance ticked up last week to 1.1 million from the 970,000 from the week before, a sign that job losses continue to plague the labor market, okay, five months into this pandemic. Now, the weekly job level claims, okay, had sunk slowly in recent months, but have remained well above historical highs, averaging still at 1.1, almost 1.2 million a week for the last four weeks. Now, economists had predicted the last week figure to approach the numbers from the previous week, they thought they'd be less which really had fallen below 1 million for the first time in about five months. Instead though, the initial claims, the new claims for the pandemic unemployment assistance, the program available to gig and self-employed workers, both went up. Now, Elizabeth Ann Conkel, okay, she's an economist at the job site Indeed, said that the depths of the damage remain to be seen. I would definitely call it a canary uh, raising alarms in the economic coal mine. That's what she said. Data shows that a number of job postings slowly recovering in recent weeks compared to posting from a year prior. However, last week postings took a turn for the worst. They had been running about 18% below normal anyway, and they fell about 20% below normal last week. The longer we go into this crisis, the longer people have been temporarily laid off and they're just not getting called back. This is what Conkle said. Now, businesses can only ride this out for, for so long. More than 28 million people were receiving some form of unemployment benefits as of August 1, the most recent week for that statistic, and about equals the, the previous week. And again, you got a big difference between Wall Street, the numbers seem to keep going up, but again, in a range and Main Street, where people are still hurting. And that really brings me to the question for the day. Can you make a difference? Now, you may have heard this story before, but it's one that you know, really need to be reminded of pretty often. So once upon a time, there was an old man and he used to go to the ocean and had to do his writing. It's a relaxing thing for him. He had a habit of walking on the beach every morning before he began his work. One early morning, he was walking along and a storm had just happened the night before, a big storm. And he noticed there was a small figure of a child and she was methodically picking up starfish and tossing them back into the surf. He paused for a moment, puzzled 
and asked her, you know, why are you throwing these starfish? It's high tide, she said. Okay. If I leave them on the beach, the sun will soon dry them up and they'll all die. I'm throwing them back in the ocean so I can, so they can live. And the mayor considered her actions and her words and for a moment and then he motioned up and down. He said, there's miles of beach here. There must be thousands of starfish on this beach. He said, I'm really afraid you're not going to be able to make much of a difference. And the young girl stopped. Her face darkened. She chewed thoughtfully on her lower lip. And she said, you're probably right. She looked down at the sand. Then she picked up and leaned over and picked up another starfish and pulled back and just tossed him gently back into the sea. And with a tone of gentle defiance, she said, but I've made a difference for that one. You see, we can all make a difference. But too often, making a difference seems so overwhelming, particularly in days like this where we seem faced with so many daunting political and social and global challenges. We think, well, I'm not in a position to make any change in any of these things, in any state, any way, shape, or form. Okay, just as the old, old man was. Okay, we do these things because we don't think we can. But it only takes a few, a few moments to stop and consider someone thoughtfully. Okay, we really able to do something to make a difference in the world in someone's life. One little thing. What little thing can you do? The most you can certainly make a difference in the world. And it's one or two people somewhere along the line. As Mother Teresa once said, you know, never worry about the numbers. Help one person at a time and always start with the one person nearest to you. So today, I want you to find a starfish. Anyone that's close to you, then pause. Take a few minutes and do something to make a difference in their world. Now, you might even find it that person could be you. That's all it takes. Just a little start to make a difference today. And you can make a difference. Just give it a try. I'm Dr. Fred Rouse, the Real Money Doctor. My only goal is to help you to get, protect, and enjoy your money, your life, and your retirement. Now, if you enjoy these sessions, you find them helpful in any way, shape, or form, you want to know more how I could possibly help you get your ultimate secure retirement that you've always dreamed of, and do it somewhere in the next three to five years, go to my site, drrousenow.com. Watch the video, see if I can help you. But for now, I appreciate you spending some time with me. And I really enjoy spending time with you. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow around seven o'clock. Thank you.